Hello and welcome to Encore. Coming up in today's show. Navigating the quicksands of despair and failure and emerging with a sense of hope. Australian author Steve Toltz administers a strong dose of irreverent black humour in his latest novel, Quicksand. It's a rumination on survival and fear that pulls no punches when sending up the everyday absurdities of life in the 21st century. Steve's here to tell us more, so let's go and meet him. Steve Toltz, thanks so much for joining us here at Thanks France for having Michael. me. Yeah. Well, this, we're starting off with your recent novel, Quicksand. Mm. It's been translated into French uh, under the title Vivant ou est ta victoire, which I suppose roughly translates as You the Living, but with what victory, which is a little bit more of a philosophical title, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> but Quicksand itself, as a title, it conjures up this terrific kind of fatal, inescapable image of, of despair, an atmosphere that's quite brooding. Is it as bad as all that for your characters? Well, I mean, the idea of quicksand for me was something from, uh, I guess, from childhood. You know, when you grew up in the 80s and you watched a lot of television, uh, there, was, there were these common tropes of characters getting caught in quicksand, which I thought was going to be, you know, a, a big fear in life. But it's also the idea that, uh, the, you know, the more you struggle, uh, the deeper you sink. And, yeah, unfortunately, my characters, uh, they get into a lot of trouble. We see that indeed. Now, the novel begins with a would-be writer and he's looking for his subject or his muse, as he puts it. And the way you describe him is perhaps a little cruel at times, as if you're poking fun at uh, serious writers or perhaps writers who take themselves too seriously. What were you saying about the profession there? Oh, I guess it's a way of, for me, these books that I've written are kind of um, sort of spiritual autobiography. So it was a way for me to divide myself in two. So part of me is, is the writer. Um, part of me is the character that the writer is talking about. Um, the book is definitely very much, uh, you know, inspired by some of my own experiences. And the character has, said has, a, has a lot of bad things happen to them, in, including being paralyzed in a wheelchair and, and that was something that happened to me. I, I had a, um, a spontaneous hemorrhage that left me paralysed and I spent some months in a wheelchair and was told that I would never walk again. And so I had to learn, uh, I guess, the dark side of, of that and had to try and find some humour in it. It's a blurry line there between reality and fiction. And, and as you say, many of your characters have this dark side and some quite bleak circumstances. Some of them are outright misanthropic. Do you think as a writer there's an element of risk? I mean, how risky is it to create characters that are hard to defend or hard to like? Hmm. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a writer that I like uh, called Cioran. He's a French philosopher. He says, you know, you should only put things into books that you would never dare say in real life. So in terms of the risks... Um, the best thing that I do, I can do for myself is never think of the reader while I'm writing, uh, because yeah, I would be too, too afraid to put some of these things down, but it is not until the moment that I've sort of hit send and sent to my publisher that I think, oh my gosh, what have I done? Okay. Now, as we mentioned, the character Liam in this novel, he fails as a novelist and mm. has to do a different job. He, he turns to the police. When you were younger, did you think of writing as a viable career? Did you always want to, to do this? No, I think it was probably my default hobby as a child. Um, and in my 20s, I, I made short films and I did a whole bunch of other things. I was kind of a cameraman and a, uh, worked, I worked on film sets and I spent a little bit as a private investigator and, you know, all those kind of uh, telemarketing and I worked as an extra uh, on, on movies. Um, for me, it certainly wasn't. And it was only when I was... Um, in my 20s, uh, struggling to make money, I, I thought I could enter some short story competitions. And I had written two stories uh, for a competition, one that I realised after I did not win, uh, could be the beginning of a novel and one could be the end. And, I, and that ended up becoming my first uh, book. Well, writing certainly worked out as a profession for you. And indeed, things are looking up for the publishing industry here in France, at least. Book sales are up with an increase of 1.5% last year. This comes after five years of a decline in sales. The increase is partly due to a number of bestsellers that have helped push up the statistics, meaning that high street bookshops can now breathe a sigh of relief as they regain a little territory from the internet giants. 
Alexander Alcott has this report. Stepping through the doors of a bookshop, after years of declining numbers, many French people are flocking back to places like this. To come to a bookshop and touch the books, it's a religion for me. It's for the advice they give you, and there are notes on the books written by the shop, so that's always interesting. For me, it's the pleasure of spending a little bit of time in a bookshop. I wouldn't change it for all the clicking around on the internet. In 2015, book sales increased by one and a half percent, and independent bookshops benefited most, rather than the large online retailers. Christian Torell manages a bookshop in Toulouse. Facing stiff competition, he's come up with a few ideas to pull people in. He organises book signings, opened a cafe and has at least 30 members of staff offering advice. We've put a lot of effort in creating places which are book places, places where people can socialize, where people can come together. So I think in today's cities, the role of bookshops is fundamental. This is shown by an upsurge in current affairs reading. Terror attacks in 2015 changed people's reading habits. Very quickly, we saw people coming back to bookshops to look for explanations or a deeper understanding or perhaps a distraction. So that's also a part of it. People feel the need to be reassured. 2015's book sales have also been boosted by bestsellers. Top of the list is the diminutive but fearless ghoulish warrior Asterix. The latest in the iconic comic book series sold more than 1.6 million copies in France alone. E.L. James's Grey sold around 625,000 copies and there were two others from the Fifty Shades series in the top ten, each selling close to half a million. And running off the top three was the French author Guillaume Musso with Central Park. The thriller set in New York sold over 610,000 copies last year. Big titles like these and people's changing habits have boosted sales and helped bookshops get back on their feet. Well, the book industry is certainly looking very healthy here in France. What about the future of publishing? Do you think that it will necessarily be digital? I think that there's always going to be two in the same way that like nobody would have suspected that vinyl would have come back. Mm. Um, so I think there's always going to be a section of people. It might be a bit more niche, uh, the people who like to read books. books. Um, and I love books and I love the feel of them. I love the smell of them. And I would never not uh, buy books. But, you know, as long as people are reading that, that is the main thing. And as long as people are reading, there will be authors, of course. Now, coming back to your book, um, you feature some very evocative descriptions of childhood, both in, in Quicksand and also in your previous uh, novel, A Fraction of the Whole. These ideas of family lines, cycles of behaviour that people seem to can't, they can't escape, these fatalities. And people, I think, in real life spend years unravelling that in therapy. Do you think we're all trapped in these repetitions? Yeah, I think I think we are, unfortunately. I mean, the, there's a quote from Kafka, which I have at the beginning of the book, which is um, that there is hope. There's um, plenty of hope, uh, just not for us. So <clears throat> I think the you know the, the the idea the idea of hope and the idea of change um, lives within us, but um, the fact is that we are not going to change very much, and and that's okay. We'll do our best. <laughs> it's despairing, but OK. Yeah. Now, going back to that first novel, uh, A Fraction of the Whole, Paris, the city, this city features as a key element of the storyline. Um, a character comes here in search of something or someone, mm. and you've lived here yourself. What is your relationship like with the city? Oh, look, I love Paris. It's the best part. I mean, I, I have a lot of... Um, I have kind of a visceral connection with the, with the written word and, you know, with... Paris. Um, so I spent a lot of my time uh, writing here in cafes and cemeteries. I, I kind of, I, I still write by hand and I write in like two hour blocks and I fit as many of those blocks uh, in a day as possible and every block has to be in a different location. So Paris is like the perfect city for that. Paris is perhaps your muse in a, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> now, as well as writing, you did mention that you've had a, a brush with cinema, work behind the camera and in mm -hmm. front of it. Uh, Australian director George Miller, Miller has just been named as the head of the Cannes Film Festival this year. Are you a fan of his work as a, as a writer and as an Australian? As a, yeah, as a writer and as Australian, absolutely. And the, the latest film, his, his new Mad Max, is just like sensational, I think. Has some of the most, um, I don't know, sort of exciting uh, action sequences that anybody has, has made, I think, in, in 20 years. Because the, um, you know, the habit of the last, um, the trend has been, you know, very fast camera and you can't really tell what's happening or else a ton of CGI and it, it all kind of looks, you know, um, kind of ridiculous. 
but the like um, the operatic kind of choreography of the of the action scenes in this film are, are extraordinary. And what do you think an antipodian might bring to this very European festival? Ah, I mean, he, well, he's I think he's a cinephile first and 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 foremost. So I think he's, you know he's just got a great taste um, for film. Okay, now we're finishing off with a little more cinema. You've chosen Quentin Tarantino's uh, latest film, The Hateful Eight, as a recent cultural highlight. Mm. What is it about Tarantino's approach to storytelling that you enjoy so much? I guess it's his writing. Uh, it's also his, you know, it's, I think his storytelling is just mesmerising. I mean, he, and he used this kind of 70 millimeter um, widescreen and then he chooses to set the whole film inside, either inside a stagecoach or inside a um, sort of one room. And so he's using this this um, cinematic technique just on on faces. And one of the faces is um, Jennifer Jason Leigh. And, and it, for my money, she was like the best actress uh, of the 90s, um, who we haven't seen a lot of. Um, and she's like demonic and wonderful in this film. And it's worth just seeing for her. Yeah, it's a great mix of, I think, like you say, writing and images. Mm. Sadly, that's all we've got time for. Steve Toltz, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We'll leave you with a short extract from The Hateful Eight. Remember, you can get more news on our website. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. One of them fellas is not what he says he is. Move a little strange, you're going to get a bullet. Not a warning, not a question. A bullet. We're talking. <laughs>